were set up to invest where others might not because of the high risk involved. At the same time, we invest together with others and help move more private capital into the markets where it's needed the most. And as you've heard, we invest in some of the world's most difficult countries, and we're still expected to adhere to the highest ethical standards. Now, these challenges and dilemmas, they become especially clear when we invest in countries with political unrest and sometimes even conflict and war. And you saw one stark example of this just now from Mozambique. Now, Norfund is also invested in Myanmar, which saw a military coup last year. Ethiopia has seen conflict flare up again between the central government and the TPLF, and just last week, a humanitarian truce was broken. In Sri Lanka, protesters stormed the presidential palace, ousted the president and the government earlier this year. And in the DRC, we are seeing conflicts again on the rise in the eastern part of the country. And Norfund has investments in all of these countries, which makes our mandate incredibly challenging. Now, how can we be a positive force for change and job creation in countries like this? And how should we act as an investor when things really fall apart? Not to answer these questions, because I think that might not be possible, but to reflect on them, we have an incredible panel together with us today. And they'll give us the humanitarian perspective, the company perspective, and the investor perspective. But we also have an incredible audience. And we'd like to ask you to participate. So if you take out your phones, and you can use the QR code that you'll see here on the screen, and it should be possible just to put your phone towards the code, and then you can pose some questions and offer reflections. Now, I can't promise you I'll get to all of them, uh, but I will do my best. Now to our panel. First, we have joining us directly from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Abdul Majid and Sikela, who is the CEO of CRDB Bank. Now, it's especially a pleasure to uh, introduce Mr. Nsikela today, because Norfund is, together with CRDB, establishing a branch of the bank in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Our second speaker is Dimanta Seneviratne, who is the CEO of NDB Bank in Sri Lanka. We also have Jan Egeland, who's the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council, and last, but by no means least, my dear colleague, Faye Chetna, who's the Regional Director for Asia. So, Dimanta, Jan, and Faye, please take the stage. And we have Abdul Majid with us online, which is great. Give them all a hand. <laughs> so, I'd like to start by talking about what things look like in the field not the kind of conceptual overall situation, but what it's really like on the ground. What it's like to work in or invest in or be present in a fragile setting. And Dimanta, I'd like to kick it off with you. NDB is uh, one of the largest banks in Sri Lanka. And as we know, a country that was hit by political and economic turmoil earlier this year. So what was it like to be the CEO of a bank in a situation like that? What happened on the ground and what did you do? Okay. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, No Fun, for having us here, inviting us. First of all, I must also thank God for uh, being on time for this conference because being in a conflict country, uh, when the country got downgraded, you had to go through so many processes to get the visa also approved. And to come on time, I had to go and get my, collect my passport from a cargo plane just hours before my scheduled flight. So thank God for that. Anyway, so that's just, part of working in a challenging situation. Yes. It has some practical implications. Exactly. So that means you also try hard. Uh, and then that's another quality, probably Sri Lanka. Now, we have gone through this uh, war for 30 plus years and just came out from that war about 10 years ago. So that's the time that we need support build up that country up, but unfortunately the current situation again. So, but the, the people are very resilient and I think hardworking, so that's another learning to you know, get more stronger. 
to answer your question about what challenges as a CEO. Uh, NDB is the, when in, uh, no one invested in NDB, that was uh, more than two years ago. We were like the sixth largest listed bank, but since then we have grown, we are now the fourth largest listed bank in Sri Lanka. Uh, but this uh, crisis, uh, what it's, I would say, again, a man-made crisis because the wrong policies, again, people should elect and appoint the right people who can take the right decisions, but unfortunately, we didn't have that. Uh, so it's a man-made crisis that brought the country's reserves down to minimal level, and then Sri Lanka couldn't sustain their debt payments. So in April, we were compelled to announce our inability to pay our debts. So uh, that created all the funding lines from especially the foreign banks, even the local banks, cutting that down. So that means access to foreign currency, the dollar-denominated uh, currencies, was a big challenge. So how, on the other side, you have customers who have deposits in foreign currencies. So how do you manage that challenge? So all that was a big challenge for a CEO to handle. You have close to a million customers. We are about 22 million population in the country. Uh, so balancing all that expectations, we are never before Sri Lanka has defaulted, and when, when this situation comes in, how to handle it? Uh, so it was a quite a big challenge, uh, Ilva. What, what were you most worried about when this happened, when uh, you know, the presidential palace was stormed? What, what were your concerns? I think the presidential palace was stormed. Uh, that was a culmination of uh, significant other events that led to that situation, because uh, the the hierarchy was not listening to and doing the right things. So it was a people struggle that came. It's actually a peaceful struggle. It was there for about three months. Uh, people then, then with the not having adequate foreign currency also have put into a situation where a country didn't have fuel to run, uh, even medicine. You couldn't uh, import the required medicine. So it was an, and certain food, uh, and that was a crisis. Uh, first of all, and then no cooking gas. So imagine, uh, especially the households in, in the Columbus city who used to, uh, not the firewood, but the cooking gas, they can't cook that. So all that is a culmination of these difficulties over a period of three months, and people realize that no, this particular appointed president was to serve his term till another two more years. Yeah. And we can't wait for that long. Yeah. So the people went, it's a peaceful struggle. I don't know, no loss of lives and, and uh, brought him out. And thereafter, a new government, a new president got elected, again through the democratic process, but to get that person, he resigned as a result of people asking him to resign. And we'll, we'll get back to, to some more of these issues. Uh, but before we do so, Abdul Majid, I can see you are a, uh, you're stand, standing strong with your team here in, in Dar. So uh, if you could turn it to, if we could turn it to you and, um, Talk a little bit about the, the DRC, which for many people is a country which is associated with war and conflict, especially the, the minerals in the eastern part of the DRC. Could you say a bit about what it's like to establish a bank in the DRC? Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon all. Um, very sorry to be there. I wish I, wish I would have been all of me. Delegate physically, but it wasn't possible. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, people are nodding, so it looks good. Yes, DRC, uh, as you said, DRC is one of the country which has, I would say, different dynamics in terms of challenges, but is also the country with the full of potential in terms of opportunities. And Tanzania is well located because we cover almost five locked countries. And if you look on DRC economic activities, they are majority the passing through Tanzania. Basically, when you move to the investment on regional perspective, we look on long term, long term nature. And um, why we the DRC, uh, we are happy that they're not going along, but together with the program. And I must thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Abdul Majid. It's, uh, is it me on the stage having trouble hearing, or is everyone having trouble hearing? 
Yeah, we're having some challenges with the connection, Abdul Majid. So I'll, I'm looking to the technicians in the back to see if they can help us with that. And then we'll just bring it to the stage for yeah. now and we'll return to you. Apologies for that. Um, Thank you. Jan, if we turn it to you, we talk about Norfund investing in some of the most challenging countries in the world. But you, as a humanitarian organization, you are truly at the front lines. So could you give us an example from your line of work of what it's like to run a humanitarian operation in some of the most difficult places on Earth? Well, uh, our middle name is, of course, to be in the places where the crisis, the conflict, and the needs are the greatest. And they come together when there is a lot of conflict, war, strife, climate change, disasters. There is a lot of poverty and there is a lot of suffering. That's where we are. We have 16,000 field workers. We're one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world now. Half of them would be in crossfire situation from Ukraine to Colombia to the Sahel to Somalia, Afghanistan. We have 1,400 uh, field workers in Afghanistan. We didn't leave with the Norwegian diplomats and the Norwegian military. We stayed. Uh, so that's, that's our job. Every day, year round, we have one or more security incidences with, uh, with people being under threat. Uh, could be a kidnapping, could be criminal acts, could be even terrorism. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if you allow me, to stay or to go uh, is easy in my view. We have to stay as long as the people are there and they have in great need. You need to stay, uh, even if you're a development actor, you need to be willing to take risk. The people are there. You, you, the development actors who left Afghanistan left 40 million civilians, half of them women and children, more than half of them women and children, behind. The one operational question you also have to ask yourself, however, is are we inferring legitimacy to the rulers, the regime, the oppressors? If the answer is yes, then you have to modify the operation. But leaving should not be the option. Right, so actually we're asking the wrong question. Should we stay or should we go? It's about how should we stay? Yes. And what does it take yes. to stay in a good way? I think that's a very nice segue over to you, Faye, heading up our office in, in Asia, which covers Myanmar, a country that you know well. Uh, and you've been part of Norfund since we entered Myanmar, uh, I believe. Yep. Uh, so when the coup happened last year, what then happened to our investees and what happened to Norfund? I mean, certainly what, what transpired in Myanmar has been extremely challenging for us. Um, you know, I, I think the first 60 days were actually the most complicated and, and very challenging because we were not able to connect to our investees and our management and our team. But I think, as to, to your point, Yan, I, I think Norfund as a global fund, we also have experience working in fragile state so those 60 days, we were able to share valuable, uh, valuable insight from operation in Zimbabwe. And some of those key takeaways allow our companies and our management, and, more, and most importantly, the safety of our employees uh, to be secure. Those things are such, such preservation of assets, uh, strengthening the, the um, security of our branches and our employees and, and our, our team. And lastly, it's also having fast decision-making process that allows you to be very agile because when you're in a crisis mode, you must be able to react quickly to what's happening locally. So those things are really, I think, some core institutional knowledge that we have built. It has obviously been very challenging because, you know, in Fund, we were the first pioneering investor in Myanmar in microfinance. We built two microfinance institutions. We don't have 16,000 people. We only have 18 in financial institutions. So for us, it's been very hard and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Faye, just a follow-up question, and this builds on a few of the questions I see coming through here on the screen, which is, you know, when will you pull out of a project or a country? What's the, what's the criteria? And when do you say enough is enough? Uh, just building on that, you know, what would have happened if Norfund had pulled the plug in Myanmar after the coup? I think we were known globally and in Asia as long-term patient capital. We're known to be very proactive when we're in taking equity investment and taking the board seat. If we leave, 
there goes our reputation. Mm. If we're supposed to be long-term investor, if we're the first one to leave, we're not really living up to our commitment. But having said that, I think the challenge is how do you stay? How do you make sure you continue to contribute and that you do more good than harm? And that's about operationalizing it, modifying it, but being resolute with our vision of being, being able to provide uh, access to finance and access to clean energy. And I just want to ask our technicians now whether we have uh, Abdul Majid on the line still and if we have some good sound. Do we know? Okay, I'll leave that I, for a while I until. Can, I know. can you hear me? Uh, I'll leave that for a while until we also get a, a, get a picture of him. Um, going back to, to Norfund's role in a situation like be it Sri Lanka or in Myanmar or in other conflict-affected states, and turning to you, Dimanta, uh, in the situation that you face, Norfund came in as an investor in 2020, and then the turmoil of this year happened. Uh, what do you think Norfund can bring to the table in a situation like that? How can we support? Yeah, I think... Um no fund came uh, in 2020, even at that time Sri Lanka was just uh, still suffering from the Easter Sunday attack in 2019. So that was, uh, uh, again, unfortunately, the tourism that was one of the major income sources to the country got affected. Even with that situation, no fund went ahead and came up as an investor. And that was the first uh, no funds equity investment in Sri Lanka. And people really welcomed that. Uh, coming in and investing in a situation like that. So thereafter, through the COVID and all, all those challenges, one way that No Fund brought us a uh, lot of stability, No Fund being an anchor investor in a bank with a 10% stake, uh, actually helped us to approach other financing institutions as well to get funds. So apart from No Fund, who also supported apart from equity, uh, another thing is that uh, on the ESG framework, the governance framework, the risk management framework, a lot of input that came in to ensure that we are quite agile on governance side so that when you get the funding from the other institutions, all those governance aspects are very well covered through the Norfund investment. So we, it's, it's basically helping you, if Norfund is a first mover, yeah. if you will, it helps attract other investors, even in a country which may be seen by some as being scary and risky and fragile. Yes. Exactly. Mm. So that helped us. So that is in part of our NDB's mandate as well. NDB actually stands for National Development Bank, PLC. But I think we started 40 years ago as a development bank, but we converted as a commercial bank. So with that... Uh, one third of our book is in small and medium enterprises. Another one third is in development oriented project lending. And we have been funding uh, one third of Sri Lanka's renewable energy projects over the last four or five years. So, you no know, fund, it's a perfect match, you know, fund, it's the same intentions coming and supporting us. And that helped us to even fund some of the Sri Lankan new projects. Plus, also, some of the Sri Lankan entrepreneurs who have gone to Uganda and also Kenya to do the renewable energy projects, especially the hydro, we supporting them. All right, so it's, uh, it's also a question of uh, moving into to other markets. Other markets. Abdul Majid, I'd love to get back to you and I hope we have uh, so, some better sound now. And I think the question that I'd like to pose is based on something you, you spoke about last week where you said that in fragile states or a country like the DRC, there's a big difference between what we see in the media and what actually happens on the ground, especially in a big country like the DRC. You know, Lumumbashi and Kinshasa are very different from the conflict-ridden areas of the East. So could you speak to what might be the implications of failing to understand the difference between what's in the media and what's on the ground? Thank you. I think that is uh, one of the biggest challenges facing many of the investors. Um, coming up in Yes, yes. Yes, go ahead. Basically, when, when you speak about DRC, it's more of the fragmented country in terms of infrastructure. And I think there is no connection between one to another city, apart from uh, flight, uh, using flights. But all cities are big enough in terms of the market. The country itself is too big. When you speak about Rogumbashi, where we tend to be starting operations recently, and there, and Kinshasa, these are big cities. 
and there is no conflict as we see from the media. Majority of the conflict are just far from the city centers. However, we have seen much development in the country in terms of political stability. They are now moving to democracy, and they have now recently been connected to East African uh, bloc. And that brings the market for the East African. And Thank what I've just highlighted initially was that Tanzania, being the country which is serving most of about five North East African countries, and DRC being the biggest market. I do expect that our decision to move to DRC was a little decision, but I'm very much happy we are moving with uh, Norfolk, uh, one of the oil investors, which comes with a good experience of different markets. So we do expect that uh, experience, understanding of the market, make us move fast in Paris. Great, thank you. I think this br brings us back to an earlier panel about the importance of understanding context. Right, that uh, things are really more complicated on the ground than they look uh, in the headlines. And if we don't understand the difference between the headlines and the realities, then we can maybe stay away from places where we actually could make a difference. I'd, I'd like to move into now some of the difficult decisions then that one has had to make, and perhaps starting with you, Jan, because I know that you have plenty of those, and you said yourself that not a day passes without you having some sort of security situation. Uh, so could you talk about one or maybe, you know, what is the most difficult decision perhaps that you've had to make in a fragile setting or an example of a difficult decision you've had to make? The, the most difficult for us now, uh, for most international actors, is whether we should speak the truth uh, publicly on what we see and what we experience or not. One example was uh, Ethiopia. We spoke out more than probably any other, of, uh, of the atrocities in Tigray. In all the international media, big platforms, uh, I was on, on, on lots of, of, of high-profile panels. We thought it was important. They were torturing the refugee camps. They were attacking hospitals and so on. So we should do the same in Ethiopia as we do in Ukraine or whatever. Um, and it ended by us being suspended, 350 staff. Uh, a program for 450,000 people was paralyzed. We were suspended in Iraq for doing the same, only a month. In Burkina Faso, a month, for speaking about, you know, the, the displacement that happened in the country. And, and no one likes to have bad news about your own country if you're the ru ruler of a place. But I think we need to speak the truth, really. Uh, and, and I would challenge also development actors I don't know, maybe no fun feels too small and vulnerable, but the larger development actors should not keep quiet when uh, the basic human rights of people are being trampled underfoot, because if we don't speak the truth, we will never reach help get out of the misery of the displaced and the betrodden and those who are in the crossfire. So I would say that is, is one among the largest uh, challenges, mm -hmm. and also actually giving a, give, getting a common front, because there are too many scared organizations mm -hmm. that are not willing actually to speak the truth of what is happening when minorities are being persecuted. Is it always right to speak the truth? I mean, sometimes you'll have almost like a systems challenge, right? If you speak the truth very vocally on some right. issue, then it might lead to people getting hurt or being put in danger. So you'll have, you might have some repercussions. You know, Are there yeah, situations where perhaps it's a judge one should call. I mean, was it, well, maybe, actually we did a mistake, mistake. We were too high profile in Ethiopia. It was not a good thing for our people that we were suspended. Mm. So the UN and the development actors saying nothing exposed us so much that we were suspended and our people were we're hurt. So I uh, argue for a common front. Let's meet. We are 150 organizations. We invest $50 billion collectively, whatever, in, in, in the place. We can speak out. Uh, if, if, if a group, say Rohingyas then in mm -hmm. Myanmar, it is a disgrace that nobody's really telling the truth about the Rohingyas that are still kept uh, in Bangladesh 
a growing economy which is not integrating them will never integrate them. That's what the government yeah. says. And Myanmar, who says we're not going to take them back at all. That would and be it's the ASEAN a, countries and China taking the lead, and we should challenge them. And it's a heartbreaking situation. And uh, then it all comes down to who does what in the ecosystem and how can we best move that forward. Uh, Dimanta, uh, over to you. And uh, what are, was one difficult decision that you had to make in the turmoil that your country's been in over the last year or so? Uh, several difficult decisions <laughs> how to prioritize. The one is uh, when, when the country's uh, foreign currency inflow was limited. So as a bank, as an intermediary in the economic activities, uh, we need to manage with that available inflow. So the liquidity management is key. Any bank can fail. All of you know that if a liquidity is not an issue, it's a capital, it's the secondary, but it's a liquidity. So you had to take some key decisions on how to control this limited inflow. So one was the importers. I think NDB has been supporting the import driven uh, for the local manufacturing, of course. Uh, but we had to say no to those uh, importers and prioritize our do dollar inflow uh, to the exporters who would export a good and then get the dollars backed with a value addition. So that was one of the key uh, decisions that we had made, and we have managed in that liquidity since the situation actually started in March up to August. And now I think we are quite comfortable that we should be able to come up with the challenge, but that was one of the key difficult decisions to ensure that we manage. Yeah. Uh, Abdul Majid, maybe I can pass it over to you too. Uh, have you had any, you know, I don't know, difficult balancing point or difficult decisions to make when venturing into the DRC? Uh, thank you. I think um, um, we have made many decisions which are difficult, but they also reflect on the comment made by our colleagues are speaking the truth. But I think there is a need to understand the country dynamics. The difficult decision I think we have made, I'll just link it with the DRC, was first of all to go to DRC. It wasn't a very easy decision. And second is which area in DRC should we start our business? Mm -hmm. So make a decision to go to DRC, to Lugumbashi, had the fundamental challenges <coughs> within our boardroom, in our management, I think. Uh, and that goes together with uh, CRDB decisions because CRDB had the same thinking like seven years ago, but they never moved to DRC. So the decision to go to DRC was not an easy. It required convincing uh, to the board level, why should we go now? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the result of discussions, we have to do our market intelligence, uh, business opportunity, and where do we need to play our ground? And I believe that was not an easy decision. But I'm sure looking at the opportunity we did see and following the country being a role in East Africa, it is the right to be seen as we speak today. Right. Thank, thank you so much, Abdul Majin. So simply deciding to go into a market, which is challenging, might be a difficult decision in and of itself. Uh, we're getting some more questions through here. And uh, Faye, here's a question for you, which is, mm -hmm. how are things going with our colleagues in Myanmar? So they're not Norfund staff, but uh, I'm assuming the, the colleagues and the people who work in our investees. I think it's obviously very challenging, right? Um, because, I mean, after the coup, I mean, it's not just the coup, it's COVID, and it's also credit crisis. So I think for us, I mean, in terms of security, it has gotten worse. Um, I think we would classify Myanmar right now as having a, a civil war, and therefore security is, is something that is fragile. Um, I think for, for our colleagues and really our friends, um, we do have sort of protocol uh, with respect to um, their, uh, the, ensuring their security, I'll just put it that way, but it's very fragile because at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of infighting and we do operate in remote areas, so security is, is never guaranteed. Yeah. Very hard. Uh, and. Uh, just to inform you, we do have substantial investments in Myanmar still. Uh, we are not doing any new investments, but we're seeking to take care of those we have in the best possible way. Um, we're going to be gloomy for a couple of more minutes, and then we're going to try and lighten up. Um, but um, Jan, uh, given the work that you do uh, and looking forward, 
what keeps you up at night? What worries you? Um, well, lots of things, of course. The security <laughs> of my staff, uh, there, there is always a, a crisis. But, but I, listen, I would say what keeps me up at night is that we're losing the battle to reach the most vulnerable in too many places. And that's, that's a, a, a collective challenge at the moment. In the growing world economy, I, I was in Bangladesh, your place, uh, uh, Faye. Yeah. On the one hand, I've never seen as many limousines in my life as before the, this main ho uh, ho hotel in, in Dhaka. And then you come to the Rohingyas with 94% unemployment. unemployment. They are sinking, really. Mm -hmm. So what, that we're not, we're failing the people in failed states and in fragile states, that collective challenge. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix it. If, mm -hmm. if not, we're just going, we, we will not even be close to reaching the de uh, Millennium Development, mm -hmm. uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's the, the number one. At, uh, it, what keeps me happy at night is, uh, is to know that we can reach people in hard to reach areas mm. like never before. Mm. We, the humanitarians, need more development partners because we, ha we have a one year budget at a time. So the board of the North Fund and North Fund leadership should really try to help us with the most vulnerable, mm. like the displaced. And I think this is uh, basically a segue over to, to you, Fame, and reaching the most vulnerable. We are a private sector investor, so not targeting the most vulnerable directly, but perhaps through our microfinance institutions. Is there a way of engaging? What would you say? Absolutely, because um, I, I fully understand humanitarian different facet, right? And for us as a development um, finance institution, we believe that the market force or our investment capital would be able to unlock those things. Mm -hmm. And certainly it's helping those in the most fragile may not be the best way we deploy our capital. For example, I remember the first deal, the first transaction that I did was a microfinance um, institution in Cambodia. And literally, literally just $100 can really make such a huge difference. And of course, not just in six months, it's also cross-generational difference, right? Because that means going back in six months is particularly particular female entrepreneur is actually able to expand her business. While we may not be able to serve the most fragile, we are enabling those who, who are at the lower income, um, income um, strata to be able to uplift them. And I think collectively, when you have experienced poverty, hmm. you have a big heart and you want to help. Of course. I'd like to be a bit more optimistic now as we're moving towards the end uh, and ask you about what makes you hopeful. Uh, and starting with you, Abdul Majid, uh, what makes you hopeful about the future in the DRC? Very briefly from your side. Yeah, as I said before, DRC is one of the biggest markets in East Africa. Mm. And the recent integration with East Africa bring much more opportunity between Tanzania and the rest of the East African countries. If you look on the infrastructure currently, and uh, look on the ESG principles, I think our partnership with uh, Noel Fund actually gives us much, much more ability, uh, experience on the ESG. For example, CRDB is a national accredited entity. We're in the process of regionalizing our accreditations. And that means we should be able to move closely with no fund expertise to build this ESG standard on, 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 on DRC. But CRDB, uh, we are digitally savvy, and with the technology which we are providing currently in Tanzania, if we deploy the same in DRC, we should be much, see much growth exponentially, not only on, on the service level, but also on touching many lives of, of DRC customers. But we'll be supporting not only Tanzania, we'll support the rest of the country in East Africa, given our geographic locations. Because all the East African countries are passing through Tanzania, the, their goods. Yeah. The terms of payment, trade uh, between two con different countries. So I see much opportunity in DRC, and I'm sure that uh, we, we expect to open our door this October, and toward year, two years to come, we should be talking different language. But the most important part is to provide financial collusions in DRC. I think they still have challenges in technology. Right. Or payments, uh, B2B or B2B, is still a challenge. 
and that means we'll be providing much needed services to the community of DRC Thank and you. touching the lives of our Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Abdul Majid. Uh, Dimanta, I'd like to ask you the same question. What makes you hopeful about Sri Lanka's future? Uh, I think Sri Lanka is a resilient uh, country uh, where we have a lot of natural resources, good talent, the literacy rate is 98%. Uh, and people like No Fun coming and investing itself is a big hope for us. Uh, especially you now, if, if I'm talking about the bank, the requirement for capital is ever increasing. When the dollar assets were, Sri Lankan exchange was 200 rupees to a dollar. That was six months ago. Now it has gone up to 365. So huge depreciation. So when you, uh, depreciation of the assets, our capital is reflected in Sri Lankan rupees. So our capital ratios have come down significantly. But one good thing here is the impactful investment like no fund is there to support when, when the bank want to go for the tap in the capital, maybe next year. But one good hope is that the political stability has come back and we are now working with the IMF program correction. Uh, so the right now the IMF team is there. Uh, the staff level agreement I think most likely by mid of September would be agreed upon. And thereafter, Sri Lanka would go for the debt structuring and along with that IMF correction. That would bring strict discipline to the economy as well. I think some other wrong decisions, the delayed right decision that we are delayed because of the political uh, pressure and all, fuel price increase is one such thing. Uh, or even the electricity, which was hugely subsidized, was increased. So all those difficult political decisions were made. So I think the IMF correction also would right time would get us out from this and as a resilient country so, so re we should be able resilience to come and out. wise decisions yes. we are running very closely towards the end but i'd like very briefly from you jan you said that what makes you hopeful is that we can reach some of the most vulnerable but very briefly from you if there's anything else and then i'll turn it to Faye before we wrap it only this um, we w soon from us will take over a generation that will be the best educated ever, they will have the best technology ever, they will be the most innovative generation ever, and they will have knowledge about ways of doing things. Uh, the the young, young refugee will in 10 years from now on have a smarter smartphone in her hand, cheaply than the one that the 80 year old president of the United States has in his hand today. And will probably be able to use it better. Uh, <laughs> Faye, what makes you hopeful, in particular about Myanmar? If Short anything. answer, uh, 21 million, that's the answer. That's the number of new clients a financial institution has been able to deliver over the past three years. That's 21 million people getting into the formal financial sector. That's what keeps me going. Thank you. Just a, a few reflections from, from my side as we, as we wrap up. Uh, we've spoken a bit about Norfund's role and what we can bring to the table. And Demanta, you said, you know, if you move in first, then you can track others and scary markets might not yeah, be yeah. So, so scary. Uh, Abdul Majid, uh, media versus reality, right? If we don't understand the nuances and the difference between those two and the nuances in a big country like the DRC, it may mean that we stay out of places where we really should have been present. Jan, you talked about when do we speak out and how. We may need to speak out more, but that also comes with some consequences and some, some real risks. Another difficult decision, uh, which is uh, more of a banking practical nature, Demanta, how to control uh, limited liquidity mm -hmm. in a crisis like the one you've faced in, in Sri Lanka, and how can you prioritize? Are we losing the battle to reach the most vulnerable, Jan? And uh, how do we best play each our role in that ecosystem to reach those most vulnerable, directly or indirectly? And then the optimistic view on the market opportunities in the DRC, but not just as a single country, but also as a network and, and as a region. But I think the most important takeaway that I have from this is we probably asked the wrong question in this panel. Should we stay or should we go? Because we have to stay. It's our duty to stay. But it's about how we stay and how we make a difference. Thank you to this panel. Yeah.